Hi, my name is Dr. Rayshon Ray, and this is my daily thought. Um, I just got finished watching uh, the, the, the Dallas surgeons who operated on the Dallas police officers, and they expressed their deepest sympathies and regards to the families for being able to for being unable to save some of those officers who are out risking their lives every day um, to to protect and serve. But one thing that struck me was the way that Dr. Williams, who was the, the black physician, spoke about essentially this double consciousness of being professional and black in America and the burdens that blackness entails for every day, for everyday life. Now, part of thinking about that double consciousness really harkens back to Dr. W.B. Du Bois, who was the first African-American to get a Ph.D. from Harvard. He got that Ph.D. in sociology. Um, I should also add that he was a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, which, the, which is the first uh, collegiate uh, black fraternity on college campuses. Um, and what he talked about was actually seeing yourself through the eyes of others. Um, in other words, seeing other people in the way that they actually see you, which is very different from the way that you see yourself, essentially extrapolating personal identities and social identities. Personal identities are our own sort of individual characteristics how we think about ourselves, how we view ourselves, how we view our self-concept. Social identities are the groups to which people associated, associate us with or the groups that we actually affiliate with. So oftentimes what happens is that for blacks in this country, we experience this double consciousness where we not only have a personal identity, but we have a social identity. And that social identity is oftentimes fractured because of the way that people view us in different ways, which leads to us having a racialized identity, which becomes a very different perspective. And I think Dr. Brian uh, Williams really summed it up well when he said, talking about police officers, I support you, I will defend you, and I will care for you. Um, that doesn't mean that I do not fear you. That doesn't mean that if you approach me, I will not immediately have visceral react, a visceral reaction to start worrying for my personal safety, but I will control that the best I can and not let that affect how I deal with law enforcement. Now, what people miss or forget or simply don't want, want to understand or simply can't understand is that being, uh, before even a black person is killed by the police, before a black person is roughed up by the police, before a black person is questioned by the police, before a black person's car plates are ran, uh, someone makes a judgment that this person should be stopped, that they shouldn't necessarily be doing what they are doing at that particular time. And as we know from uh, studies, say, like the New York City study on Stop and Frisk, that overwhelmingly these individuals who are black and, and male are oftentimes not doing anything wrong. They are simply not allowed to be unconditionally free in, um, in our society. One specific example is with the Philando Castile uh, murder, that the officer who pulled him over um, said that Philando Castile had a wide nose. Now, that wide nose, he wasn't just saying he had a wide nose. It was symbolic of and figuratively representative of how he thought about blackness, how the ways that he thought about blackness being dangerous, the ways he thought about blackness being threatening, the ways he thought that this, prob this person probably fits a protocol of someone else I've pulled over. And the fact that Philando Castile has been pulled over over 50 times in the past 14 years speaks to the way that not only Philando Castile's personal identity is subjugated, because if you've been pulled over that many times, people should know your face by that point. But instead, they don't. This leads to people getting confused all the time, right? I mean, I get confused with my colleagues on a regular basis who are black, who look nothing like me. I mean, they look nothing like me. But instead, we get confused for each other because our social identities oftentimes trumps our personal identities. And this is what's key. Um, oh, yeah, and also let me add, it, it's, you know, it makes me think about uh, Beyonce's formation where she talks about, uh, you know, Jackson 5 nostrils. And I'm personally, I'm excited to have that, right? And what's, what's interesting, I take pride again in the fact of being black and sort of what that means. And I talked about that uh, the other day. What becomes interesting, though, is beyond the external factors. Dr. Eastman, who um, is Dr. Williams' colleague and friend, and they hang out at, outside of work, their friend, their, their, their kids get together. What he said, and he, he's also a former cop, he's now a surgeon, a trauma surgeon, along with Dr. Williams. He said it best. He said, on the inside, we all look the same. We all bleed the same. And as I looked at those two men embrace, Dr. Williams being black, uh, Dr. Eastman being white, it made me personally think about uh, one of my best, one of my best friends from childhood, uh, Brian Travis, who he was in my wedding. I was the best man in his wedding. We played football. 
uh, growing up together. We would run together. We would play together. I would go over his house, see his parents, go over there and eat. He would come over my house and eat. Uh, when my granddad was trying to move uh, some furniture, I think it was a washer and dryer, a bed, and some other things by himself that he probably shouldn't have been doing. I called Brian. He was there in 30 minutes. Uh, he went to put up some ceiling fans for my grandparents. Now, I say all this not to necessarily make it where it's like, oh, I have that one white friend, like a lot of, you know, that, that white people typically do, where they say, oh, I have this one black friend, and supposedly that doesn't, you know, that, that means they're not racist or that they're not discriminatory. No, th this is much deeper than that. Instead, this is about the fact that Brian and I have real conversations. That's what makes people real friends. Conversations matter. We have real conversations about affirmative action, crime, education, pay equity, right? And we debate and we argue. And then when we leave, we're still friends because that's what friends do. And if you can't have real conversations with your, with your friends, who can you have them with? But this is what's important. Oftentimes, and what people don't get is that we live very segregated lives. This can be in the same city, town, or even, or even neighborhood. People who live next door to each other can live in very different worlds because of race. And that is what Dr. Williams and Dr. Eastman were really speaking to. And so for you, I ask you, how many friends of a different race do you have? If you had to name your top five or ten friends that you call, are they of a different race? Um, then you are how many of them, right? How many of your kids' friends are of a different race? How many of them have been over to your house? I was on headline news last year where... Uh, a black girl in Memphis invited one of her white friends from school and the white girl was so distraught over the incident that she wrote a letter to her black friend in school and told her why she could not come to her birthday party. It was written wonderfully. It was colored. Every letter was basically a different color. And she said, my daddy will not let me come because you're black. These kids are under 10 years old. This is what race is doing, right? So here are these two girls in the same school, in the same class, they're best friends. But yet and still, when they leave school, they are living in two totally different worlds, right? And so, how many of your kids' friends are of a different race? How many black people have ever been to your house? How many black people have ever been to your church? At your future funeral, how many people of a different race than you will be there? But you know, maybe this is how some of you want it. If so, then clear the way for people who want a better society for their kids and for their kids' kids. Now, I want to address two other, two other quick points. First, people have this whole notion, like the, the, the officer who killed uh, Philando Castile. They say, well, he's such a nice guy. Well, what people don't get is racists can be nice, right? Racists can be nice. I mean, you can be racist and still be nice. It's like saying, oh, well, he's a sexist. I mean, he, he grabbed my ass in the club, but he... He's a nice guy. He's still a sexist, right? And so we, we act as though that people who are implicitly or explicitly, um, as it relates to implicit bias, explicit bias, racist or sexist, that they still can't be nice people. Though they can be very nice, nice in other aspects of their lives. But when it comes to this particular issue, this is where the problem lies, and this is what we're talking about. My last point is I want to talk about the critics of Black Lives Matter. And I want to harken back to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s letters from a Birmingham jail. People oftentimes don't realize what he was talking about in that particular letter. He was speaking to um, clergymen, white clergymen, but also black clergymen and black conservatives who felt that the civil rights movement was moving too fast, that they weren't being patient enough, that they were in the streets marching too much, that they were causing a ruckus. You know what's interesting about that narrative? That same narrative exists today about Black Lives Matter. Right. When I was talking to one of my colleagues, Dr. Abigail Sewell, who is a sociology professor at Emory, she said that some of the critiques that we're seeing right now, particularly from our uh, black leaders, such as Andrew Young, uh, who's a former mayor uh, of Atlanta um, and later went on to, to do some things uh, more broadly for for our nation. Um, Kasim Reed, who is the current mayor of Atlanta and even President Barack Obama, is that th their comments are actually beyond politics of respectability. Now, politics of respectability speak to the fact that when black people in particular engage a particular in a particular way or move about, that they should do it with a certain type of respectability and that allegedly disrespectability is going to keep us safe. It's going to keep us from dying, keep us from being critiqued, keep us, keep us from being critiqued at work, keep us from being marginalized. And I think sometimes what people forget, MLK was killed in a suit, right? I mean, it doesn't get more respectable than that. 
right? Black people were marching in suits in the 60s. It did not stop their heads from being bashed in, right? So what's happening with Black Lives Matter, these same critiques we're seeing about Black Lives Matter were also made with the civil rights movement. And what's fascinating is that people like Andrew Young, who was at the center of that particular movement, is now critiquing black lives. And so what Dr. Sewell was talking about is that this is not just politics of respectability. This is beyond that. This is accommodationalist politics, where when you engage in, a poli in accommodationalist politics, you appeal to mainstream perspectives instead of actually worrying about justice, which is what we should be talking about. Instead, you become the system. In, in, in becoming the system, you get co-opted and you lose track of who you are. And that's not right. So it's interesting when I hear Mayor Kasim Reed of Atlanta say that MLK wouldn't have been marching on highways. What? What? What are you talking about? Just, just, just search MLK. This dude shut down interstates and highways. What are you talking about, right? When I hear Barack Obama make critiques about Black Lives Matter and say that they're they're off base, that 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 they're that they're ill focused, I'm like. No, they're actually not. What are you talking about? Right? When I hear Andrew Young call these individuals brats, I wish that they would just get tired of what they're doing. You're not going to get tired, right? Because when you're experiencing conditional freedom, you don't get tired from that because you are working toward a goal that is unconditional freedom, right? So critiquing these individuals is problematic. And there's another perspective because if some people think that these people are being critical because they aren't getting credit for the change, well, if you're upset that you're not getting credit for change, then you actually need to step aside. You actually need to get over your ego attack. And in doing so, if you're not in the streets seeing the overwhelming majority of people of various race and, races and ethnicity supporting Black Lives Matter in positive ways, then be quiet because you are just going off of the limited uh, views that we get from TV. Right. And we already know the way that TV portrays black and brown people. I mean, in fact, they've had a difficult time with the fact that the crowds at these rallies have been really racially diverse. I mean, if you watch the camera, they're really trying to pan for parts where they can find just black and brown people in one place. And it's, it's difficult for them to find it. Right. Just pay attention to how the cameras move and how they switch off. This is kind of what's going on. So what's happening is that Black Lives Matter is forcing people to take it seriously. This is what Black Lives Matter is doing. And so if you're if you are down with that, then move aside, take your place on the throne. We will happily anoint you, give you your crown and keep marching on down the highway like MLK was doing. Most of the marchers are young people. They are college students. They are college students who are disenfranchised and marginalized and upset with the narrative that my generation and older generations gave them about equality. We told them eight years ago when they were 12. Right. Oh, Barack Obama, this is going to turn into a new day. We're going to experience equality. Now they're in college and they're like, when I get my degree, it's not going to change how I'm treated, whether I'm on campus or whether I'm off campus. And that bothers me. Right. So similar to the marchers in Memphis who held a peaceful protest. Um, and, and a lot of these individuals who helped organize this were members of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, uh, Cap Eta chapter at the University of Memphis. Uh, which I'm proud to be a part of, of that particular chapter, we're marching peacefully on a bridge in Memphis that connects Memphis to West Memphis, Arkansas. And who was marching along with them? The police chief. That's leadership. And we see that, right? And we need to see more of that. So Black Lives Matter is a dynamic, multifaceted justice organization. And if you're about real justice and real equality, then you are actually down with Black Lives Matter.